we use the sort of metaphor that dogs are captive animals to make the point that dogs are trying to adapt to a human-dominated world, and we really control everything they do. This is Defender Radio. I'm Michael Howie, and this is Defender Radio, the podcast for wildlife advocates and animal lovers, brought to you by the Fur Bearers. It's officially summer. I enjoyed bringing in the season with friends at a solstice party. Though JJ and I are now camped out in the dark, trying to keep the Defender Radio enclave cool and somehow less humid. And because it's just about the end of June, I want to take a second before the interview this week to remind everyone about fireworks. Avoid setting them off if you can. Every person I know who works in animal control for an SPCA or Humane Society or in wildlife rehab absolutely dreads holidays involving fireworks. To many people, fireworks are exciting shows of light and sound. But to many non-human animals, they're absolutely terrifying. And not only that, people with post-traumatic stress disorder, other anxieties and other mental health challenges can and do suffer when fireworks are launched. In my neighborhood, it literally sounded like a war zone on the May 2-4 weekend. JJ wouldn't go outside at night for at least three days after that. So, if you're looking to celebrate with fireworks, please attend a large gathering where it's contained and scheduled. Follow your local bylaws regarding location and timing of fireworks. Make sure you're driving carefully and mind critters of all shapes and sizes who may be scurrying away from the explosions. And please be considerate of everyone, regardless of species, with whom you share your community. And on the note of doing our best for the animals in our communities, let's get talking about dogs. As many of you know, I'm a dog guy. I share my home with JJ the Hamilton Hound, who you'll often hear clicking around and bringing me toys while I'm interviewing folks. In fact, right now I am scratching her bum and she is doing a little step steps tap, so you might hear that. And as you may also know, I'm a huge fan of Dr. Mark Beckoff. He's a prolific writer, professor emeritus of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Colorado, and, as an ethologist, has incredible experience, wisdom, and insight into the animals around us. Along with his friend and regular writing partner, Dr. Jessica Pierce, Mark co-authored Unleashing Your Dog, a field guide to giving your canine companion the best life possible. I'm describing this book as the book anyone should read before they read a dog training book. Because this isn't a dog training book. Unleashing Your Dog examines our relationships with dogs and challenges us to give our dogs what they need to truly be who they are while living in a human world. Mark joined Defender Radio to discuss the motivations for the book, how we can all use the tools of ethology to learn more about the non-human animals in our lives, and what exactly unleashing your dog means. To start, I I want to talk about captive dogs because as soon as I opened this book, and I was excited when I got it, uh, and I opened it, my back went up right away uh, (laughs) because I I saw the words captive dogs and I went, oh, no. (laughs) But uh, as I went on, you very quickly say, oh, no, 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 no. That's not what we mean. So can can we talk a little bit about some of the terminology, uh, specifically about sort of captive dogs? And there's a couple other things that kind of come up as we go, like captivity and freedom versus deprivation and enhancements and stuff like that. Yeah, so, so we use the phrase uh, captive dogs, or we use the sort of metaphor that dogs are captive animals to make the point that you know, dogs are trying to adapt to a human-dominated world, and um, that, and we really control everything they do. You know, when they can eat, where they can eat, what they can eat, who they play with, when they play with, how much they can play, um, when they can pee, poop, go outside, get exercise, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't mean it in a pejorative way. What we really mean it why we really use that um, metaphor and that idea is so that people realize how much they are in control of the lives of their dogs. Mm -hmm. And so it then begins to lead into what we call these deprivations and enhancements, where it's a deprivation 
to keep your dog inside all day. It's a deprivation when you take your dog for a walk and you don't let them sniff or listen to the sounds around them. And the way you can enhance their lives or you can enhance these, you know, basically built-in deprivations is to let them sniff and let them look for sounds and, and give them as much agency as you can. And that basically means give them as many freedoms and as many choices as you can while keeping them safe. Yeah. And that's a, a very interesting uh conversation i mean reading the book it's fascinating and i was thinking every time i was reading something my my book from you um and I'll, I'll post this on instagram or on the patreon it's covered in highlighter marks and there's notes in the margins because as i go i think oh i'm gonna ask about this and i got that back off this time <laughs> and then i go to the next page I'm like damn it he figured it out um uh, apparently i'm not smarter than you is what i'm saying but no 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 <laughs> uh, one of the things that you write uh, is that it refers to a type of existence and not its quality. And I thought that was such an important distinction to make because when we have conversations about dogs, um, and we'll get into this as well, the way we all perceive dogs is different. So I found that that phrase, uh, existence, not quality, was really important. Is that something you were conscious of, like that your audience is going to be very varied? Uh, that's a fun one. Um is going to be quite varied as you 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 put this together, or is that something that it's just the way you wrote it? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure we spent much time thinking about that. I mean, one of the points we wanted to make, and I don't know if this is related, is that the quality of life for each and every dog matters. But because dogs are such unique individuals, what works for, for Harry may not work for Tom or Pluto or Jethro, say all males, and what works for Mary might not work for Mabel or Veronica or Molly or whoever, you know, a dog is called. And so I'm not sure if that answers your question, Mike. It, it kind of does. It's it, how you got to it uh, is really kind of the interesting thing. And I guess that's one of the questions I wanted to ask, and I didn't want to lead with it because I wanted to get the captive dog thing covered off first. But right. what led to writing this book? Because this feels like it came out of a conversation. It re That's the way it reads to me is it feels like you and, and Jessica Pierce were just having a beer and talking about dogs and went, hey, you know what? We should write this down. Well, the, the book materialized over years. So Jessica Pierce <coughs> wrote um, a book called The Last Walk, which is about end of life decisions mm -hmm. and quality of life decisions for dogs and, and, you know, other companion animals, but mostly dogs. And then she wrote a book called The Last Walk about the ethics of pet keeping. And then we wrote um, The Animal's Agenda together. Yep. And through all these books... And, and my canine confidential, we kept talking about, basically talking about what unleashing your dog turned out to be. And, you know, once again, talking about, you know, writing about the enormous responsibility it is when a person decides to bring a dog home and you hope into their heart. You know, the enormous responsibility it is when you make that decision as their guardian, you know, caretaker, caregiver. Um, the enormous decision it could be in terms of the way in which you spend your day, your time, energy, budgets, um, when you work, how you work, what you do in your free time, and the economics of it. That, you know, bringing a dog home, you'd hope that it would cost you very little because then it means the dog's pretty healthy, but, but also recognizing that, you know, Bringing a dog home could be an enormous financial um, commitment. And so it's getting people to think up front about what it means to bring a dog home. Um, the other reason we wrote it was, there's a couple of, was that, you know, the book is organized around their senses. And... Um, we write a lot that it's important to have dogs exercise their senses as well as their bodies. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, once again, when you talk to people about it, you know, they, they'll often go, oh, yeah, well, of course that's important. But they don't recognize that pulling a dog along on a leash 
and while the dog is trying to sniff and, you know, planting all four feet into the ground so that he or she can sniff. Or when they stop and they cock their head around and move their ears, they're trying to locate a sound or hear a particular sound. That those are all deprivations, but they need to exercise their senses. So, um, you know, another reason also is most people's vision of dogs centers on Western homed dogs, but very few people realize that around 85% of dogs in the world, which is probably give or take 800 million, because it's been estimated there's between 900 million and a billion dogs on wow. this planet. Um, so around 800, 850 million are free ranging or feral. You know, they're, they're on their own and some have some human contact and some have none. So we really wanted to draw the distinction that not only is it important to uh, focus on individual dogs and their personalities and what they want and need, but also to remember that a small fraction of dogs really live in or, you know, even near human homes. Yeah, and that's uh, I actually had this question come up and you you touch on it briefly and it's something that I, I'm certain we've talked about in the past is our dogs wolves. And the reason I bring this up is because when we talk about roaming dogs, they form um, little societies, I guess. I don't I am not well versed on this. I have heard other people talk about it, but mm -hmm. it's it, they say it's fascinating to watch roaming dogs has that choice to be domestic because that's kind of the, the prevailing theory right now i think um has that influenced them significantly or are they still a wild animal or are they maybe some special in-between position right well dogs aren't wolves i mean there's no doubt about it i mean and they're not you know wolves aren't dogs um you know i think it's reasonable to assume that somewhere in their genome you know, once again, this is a very general statement, but, you know, there are things that dogs do that wolves don't do. I'm not going to say they can't do because you can train them sometimes to do things, but following pointing, following gazing, um, it almost seems like there's something hardwired in there to expect to have some sort of a close relationship with humans. I'm not going to say that if they don't have it, they get depressed and all that, because no one's ever really studied it. So we don't know if dogs born, you know, in a feral or free-ranging community have different expectations. But, but of course, it turns out that most of those dogs, if you socialize them young, if they're hard to differentiate from dogs who are born, you know, in homes or in kennels or, uh, you know, someplace like so that. So kind of a different walk to the um, same place. Walk to the same place. Yeah, exactly. And so, so I think that, you know, genetically there could be something that really ties them to humans more so, you know, than, than um, something that might tie wolves to humans, and we know dogs read us very well. Um, you know, they read our facial expressions very well. Um, I just posted something on Psychology Today that showed that they match their cortisol yes. levels and level of stress to those of humans. So, you know, that's a pretty unique mm -hmm. relationship. And, and when you see that kind of behavior and then realize that it has some kind of physiological or hormonal basis, um, you know, there's a lot there to argue that there must have been some selection evolutionarily for um, for that predisposition to form bonds with humans. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, there, there is definitely a, an inherent logic to that. And that cortisol article I thought was fascinating. I, I don't think they're at the point uh, of causal, but there's a, an inarguable correlation there. Uh, but it does bring up an yeah. issue, and this is something you talk about, is studying dog behavior is difficult and it's not actually been done that much which it, it's funny i i, I have a, a a number of friends who are uh, dog trainers behaviorists involved in one way or another and there's always this oh well what's the study say 
right? I mean, like if I'm talking about bears, I can reference this massive right. list of these huge studies funded by government, funded by universities. When we're talking about dog behavior, we're frequently looking at these tiny sample sizes. Um, and it's just, it, I don't know. It's, it's very confusing. I think one example I'll use is, uh, I can't remember what the behavior they were looking at was, but I think they had 15 dogs and it was self-reported. And my friend mm -hmm. and I were arguing back and forth about it. And I said, the sample size is too small to draw any reliable conclusions. And he said, the point is not to draw a conclusion, but to show the behavior is possible. And it, it was just, it was a very interesting situation we live in when we spend billions of dollars taking care of these animals who share our homes. I mean, myself, like my dog, JJ, she, uh, she had bloat last year. Um, and between yes. bloat and her follow-up care, I think I spent eight grand on it uh, without yep. batting an eye. Um, I was very fortunate that my yep. friends fundraised for me, but you know, it's what we do. We have huge industries, yet we know so little about behavior. Uh, uh, why, why, why? That's the question. There's no follow up. Just why don't we do more? Why isn't this something that we've invested in when clearly uh, uh, and I can speak to Canada and the US, I'm not going to speak for the rest of the world, but we've clearly said dogs are important to us. Well, I'll tell you what's really interesting. You know, one of the things that when I write about dogs, I try to bring to the discussion when I can is that, you know, I'm trained in ethology. I'm trained to watch animals. I'm trained to ask questions about the evolution and ecology of behavior like I've done for wild coyotes or wolves or mm -hmm. penguins in Antarctica or different birds around my mountain home. And so <clears throat> what always surprises me is I think that a lot of the lab studies that are highly controlled, you know, they produce very interesting data. But what really surprises me is how few dog researchers and few trainers have actually watched dogs just either at a dog park or free running on trails or something like that outside of a very controlled situation. And so, so as an ethologist, I try to bring that perspective into how I view dog behavior. So why has dominance evolved? Why have different forms of set marking evolved? Why have different forms of play and play soliciting evolved, you know, questions like that. Why, why have certain patterns of sniffing or ground scratching or sniffing um, evolved? And when I get in these discussions with people at dog parks or when I give talks, they're fascinated by it. Um, and then, you know, sometimes they'll say, well, what, how important are these studies in laboratories? You know, they're usually small samples in different, under different conditions, different dogs, different people, different dog human relationships, et cetera, et cetera. And my response is, I think they were important and interesting. I'm sometimes not sure how much, some of them, not all, of course, but some have to do with real dog behavior. Mm -hmm. So that's not to say, and I want to always be clear, that's not to say that the quality of the research is bad. It's more to say, is it ecologically relevant? You know, is, is it really tell us much about how dogs evolved or how dogs, when they're on their own, um, behave? Yeah. And that's that's a, a wonderful point. And that's something I know um, in talking about wildlife. And this is something, again, you and I have talked about in the past, uh, as well as many, many other people, is the whole concept of studying wildlife in captivity. Uh, it just doesn't work. You can't because you're not seeing what wildlife does. You're not seeing what this animal behaves like. You're seeing what they behave like in a laboratory or in a zoo or in this corner of that room specifically. And the context for behavior is so important, which is a point that really gets driven home by this book, I think, uh, mm -hmm. is that question of context, uh, which is difficult to define sometimes, I think. Uh, speaking of um, ethology, though, something that I came across in this book and I absolutely love is you've got this little section. It's about uh, one, two, three and a half pages long, uh, making and using ethograms. Mm hmm. I think this, I, I love this idea, and I'm going to write about it for our Young Defenders website okay. um, as well, because I think it's so cool. So let's talk about what ethograms are and why you decided to put this in the book. Yeah, well, that, that gets back to the very, very, very basic 
question about who dogs are and what they do to becoming fluent. I, you know, I always say fluent in dog or dog literate. Mm -hmm. And so an ethogram is just a list of their behaviors, you know, the different actions they perform. Um, no, you don't have to put anything down other than, oh, they crouch on their forelegs, um, the hair on their back goes up, their ears are erect, um, they bite it, they bite another dog on the head, the body, the legs, the belly. Um, so they're basically, it's a menu of different actions. And then over time, you can begin to ascribe some kind of function to them, maybe. Um, but the ethogram is just a menu of, and it's really purely <laughs> descriptive. It's the first step in any study. When I had students doing field work with me on coyotes, sometimes, you know, they spend 20, 30 hours just watching, not watching through a camera either, <laughs> but watching, sometimes through a spotting scope, sometimes through binoculars, and listing the behaviors, just Coming up with a name, face bite means the face was bitten, a bow and play, play bow, um, you know, sniffing, uh, sniffing different parts of the body. The reason that's really, really important is because there's a limited repertoire. I mean, you know, maybe it could be 50 or 100 actions that are used in this di same and different context. So it's important to know when different behavior patterns are performed. And that's the first step in becoming an ethologist. And it's the first step in becoming fluent in dog or dog literate. And from there, you know, you can combine actions, you can separate them more. You know, you might not see one very, very often. So it doesn't mean that it's not important, but it just means that it's not part of their regular repertoire. One of the things I want to talk about briefly, because I take the opportunity to talk about this whenever I can, is poor, poor understanding of dog behavior, um, or I should say understanding dog behavior, but using archaic methods to manipulate it, I think is more accurate. Mm -hmm. um, for example, and this is one that I will remember forever, a trainer wrote in a book, mass pu like mass public uh, markets, uh, mass market public, you know what I'm trying to say, paperback book. <laughs> in all the stores, uh -huh. that um, you should pinch a puppy's ear to show them that you can stop them being discomfort, right? So as soon as they yelp, you let go. And then you can use that as a correction when they're doing something you don't like. And uh -huh. that is something I still see. Um, and uh, as a, a caveat, and you'll enjoy this, I see people walking their dogs on prong collars with extendable leads. Well, yeah. Uh, which I, 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 I can't, because if I try to talk to them, I just scream yeah. and say, you're literally telling your dog two different things. But anyway, uh, yeah. what can we tell people? This is how I want to phrase this. Uh, how do we tell people how to identify good uh, training and behavior concepts from bad, keeping in mind that yet there there is some uh, subjective reasoning in there. However, I think most people with the the training and the time can attest that correction based training doesn't teach a dog what to do. It teaches them that you can correct them. Yeah, I mean that's a good point. You know, there's a big move among many dog trainers. I would, I would like it to be most, if not all, to really focus on positive reinforcement training or force-free training. I mean, you can get a dog, just like you can get a human being, to do whatever you want by being in their face and dominating them, making them f live in fear and, you know, f making them feel unsafe. And you can get results using those methods, but, you know, they're, they're sort of the quick and dirty ones usually. But then you scar the animal because who wants to be living with a dog or a human who it, who feels fear and, and unsafe? So they do it. They do what you want them to do, but they're suffering from chronic stress, yeah. for example. So, um, so I think that you know, in terms of the choices of methods that people use, like this pinching the ear. I mean, I don't see. I mean, I've never, I actually had never heard that. So that, that kind of 
took me by surprise. But when I've come up with situations, yeah, I'm not a dog trainer, and I stress that to people. But when people ask me questions, um, it just and, and and if I think I can answer them, I will. But I always preface it with the disclaimer that I'm not a trainer. Then. Um, you know, I'll always say that, you know, when I post some of these similar questions to really good trainers, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll say, well, there's no reason for punishment based, you know, so if pinching the air is a little painful, you know, who knows whether it's aversive to the point that you're doing damage, but they would always argue that there's another way to get, to get the same result that wouldn't involve pinching the ear. Absolutely. That's, um, yeah, it's 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 I don't see the pinch too often. I have read it, as I said, in a book. Uh, I see prong collars frequently and I see e collars, which is the fancy new name for shock oh, yeah. collars most of the time. Right. And I think one of the flaws and this is, again, it's it's when you try and break it down to its logical component or just take the facts and kind of get rid of all the spin that comes with it. You have to cause discomfort to the point that an animal will stop doing something. That's that is the the foundation of that training method. Yeah. Uh, right. And right. if the dog doesn't respond, that means you have to up the discomfort. Right. And yeah, exactly. You know, you're upping the ante. And at some point, you know, just like a person might say, all right, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. You really haven't taught them anything, but they might decide they're doing it because they're afraid you'll punish them or, you know, or they're just so stressed out. So, yes, you can get results. But the best and enduring long term relationships between say, a person and a dog, really come from this mutual respect, you know, this mutual tolerance, um, trade-offs, where sometimes you get what you want and need, and sometimes they get what they want and need, but you don't manipulate them using, using force. And when you're fluent in dog, you can read that not only can you read dog, but you can read your individual dog and know what he or she wants and needs, which could be very different from another dog with whom you shared your home. Yeah. And uh, the other aspect that, too, is the dog may say, um, yes, I'll do that. Fine. But they also may say, you pinched me. I'm going to stop you from pinching me um, because that's the other way people respond to violence is with violence of their own. And that is often when we see a uh, quote unquote aggression, I think. Oh, yeah, um, dogs will do that. I mean, you know, there's classic videos on the web of some, quote, popular dog dominators who wind up getting bitten or attacked by a dog who they're who they're basically brutalizing. Yeah. So at some point, you know, a dog is going to say enough is enough. You know, I mean, and, and of course, it depends on the individual dog. And of course, it depends on their background. Yep. Of course, it depends on how safe they feel and do they get a sense that, you know, whoever the person is, is willing to work with them. But but so but, you know, so many of the relationships we're focusing now on homed dogs, you know, are so skewed to be in the name of the human that, you know, dogs sometimes just give up. But at some point they just go, hey, look, you know, I've got a right to have a doggy life mm -hmm. and. And, you know, the way you're treating me, even if you take me on long walks and even if you treat treat me with high quality food that I like and stuff like that. But this gets back to two very important, really important myths among the many that are out there. And the one is that dogs are unconditional lovers. So what that does is that opens the door for a lot of people to say, well, my dog will love me no matter what I do, and my dog will love other people. And that's just not true. You know, if you've ever rescued a dog who's had some psychological problems, then you know that they are very selective in who they, who they trust, you know, and who they give any kind of positive affection to. And when people go, oh, dogs are just our best friends. Well, they're not. If dogs were our best friends, you wouldn't have rampant dog abuse. And people are shocked to know the rates of occurrence of dog abuse. So, yeah. And when you consider how many of them there are on the planet and how many of us there are on the planet, um, huh. kind of feels like that's an inevitability almost. Um, and that's yeah. a great, a great point, though, is, is considering the dog's point of view. Um, yeah. And this this is an exercise in empathy I think we can all do. 
And I think starting with a dog is really one of the best ways. Uh, what does my dog most need and want? So you ask this question uh, as an exercise for people who are trying to figure out how do I do a little better? Yeah. Uh, and one of the things I, and this, this is one of my little aha moments I've got him. Um, you note that 13% of people, according to one study, don't do research before getting a dog. And about a third of people, according to another study, felt very, uh, only about a third, felt very informed about the basic welfare needs of dogs. Yeah. So is asking that question the like, it, the intent to try and change those numbers? Yeah, it's basically, you know, to get people who decide to bring a dog into their home. But you can say the same about a cat or a guinea pig or a rat or a mouse, they learn some of the very basic aspects of dog behavior, cat behavior, guinea pig behavior, for example. Um, you know, just the very basics, knowing what, you know, a particular posture may mean, knowing when an animal is unhappy, knowing when you're doing something that, excuse me, that makes them happy. And so um, I don't think it's asking too much. You know, some people will go, you know, and it depends on, you know, who you talk to and where you're talking to them. But some people say, well, if we if we ask too much of, you know, this is particularly for people rescuing dogs or fostering dogs out of shelters, humane societies. You know, if we ask too much of them, they won't take a dog. But that begs the question of if you don't ask certain things of them, how happy will the dog be? And will you then have that dog be returned? You know, the return rate can vary. I don't know, you know, there's no there's no one number, but some of the numbers I've heard, you know, are very are fairly high, which is really disturbing because once a dog's been home or to a place that he or she can call home, um, that becomes their home. And they don't wanna be shuffled around like, you know, they're a piece of furniture because Oh, that family didn't like this, and this family didn't like this, and I wasn't cute enough, and blah, blah, blah. They want to find security. And that's what, I mean, that's among the reasons we wrote um, Unleashing Your Dog, is that you can read your dog, give them the best life possible, and know when they feel safe, and know when they don't. Mm -hmm. And that's something, uh, and I'm going to do a little anecdote here. Uh, JJ, who is my dog, and again, uh, I don't know what order, I've, I've done five interviews in three days, so I don't know what order things are coming out in, but um, she was laying behind me during an, oh, now she's looking at me. She was laying behind me during an interview, and I posted a picture of it. She's doing it again. Um, she lays right behind my work chair. So she, know, I think it's because she wants to know when I'm getting up. Um, but anyway, uh, we lived in a multi-dog household for a while and she was having a hard time interacting with the other dogs. Uh, she's an anxious girl. I rescued her and it was just her and I for a long time. So there's some guarding behaviors, which are born out of, uh, anxieties. And one of the things that started to make this massive change, absolutely massive. Uh, and I, it comes up in your book, uh, in a great anecdote as well. When I started rewarding her and saying, you're such a good girl when she'd come over to me yeah. and when she'd see another dog, uh, you know, she was leash reactive, which you also talk yeah. about. And rather than say, no, don't do that. And pulling on the leash and making a big deal of it. The second she sees another dog, she gets a treat or a reward of some kind. Often yeah. it's just words, but the, the change in her personality was incredible. She started focusing on me more rather than the things that were giving her anxiety. And yeah. It has improved our relationship, I think, easily, and we're communicating better now. It's, I mean, it sounds like I'm talking about a, a spouse, but uh, frankly, this relationship has lasted longer than uh, both of my marriages. So, um, <laughs> I mean, I mean, what you're saying is exactly true. She trusts you. She feels safe, and you don't have to, you know. I mean, occasionally you do say no to a dog, and some people say you never have to say no to a dog, and that's not true. I mean. You know, it's like raising a kid. Sometimes you just have to say no. It depends on how you say no, you know, or how you direct that redirect their attention. So just saying, you know, no, we don't do that might be okay rather than screaming no or, you know, beating them or yanking them and, you know, lifting them off the ground by some stupid choke collar. Yep. That's that's a form of saying no, but it's got far more undesirable effects than 
saying, oh, no, come here and give him a treat. Or like you said, positively rewarding her when she does something that you like. Mm -hmm. and Something when she something that you like is when she stops doing something you don't like. <laughs> well, and it's fun. I think it's got to look ridiculous to people because I walk down the street and I'm a relatively big guy. I'm six foot. I've got a big voice and I've got a big beard and I've got tattoos and the whole bit. And I'll be walking my black and tan dog down the street and she'll okay. look up and see a cat and look at right. me and I go. Yes, good girl. What a good girl you are. And I jump up and down and she jumps up and down. And we continue on our walk. So I think it's it probably looks kind of silly, but I mean, that's that's the nature of it. And she feels, I think, much safer now. She doesn't need to be on guard for those things. Um, yeah. And, and that's a perfect way to redirect. You know, you could say you redirect her behavior. She's unlearning something, perhaps. Yep. I mean, she may be unlearning something that worked in the past. And so, sure. And that, that, like I was just saying, that's another great example, Mike, of how when situations come up, since I'm not a trainer, but when I talk to people who really practice, you know, diligently um, positive reinforcement, force-free training, they'll always say that there's a way to deal with every situation that doesn't involve punishment per se. And your dog is confident, you know, you, who knows what's going on in her doggy brain other than you've, you've taught her. Cause I like to think of training as teaching. You've taught her that there's things she might do that you don't like. I mean, of course the cat might not like it either, but that's not important that you would prefer her not to do, and she does it. She does what you want her to do. You're, 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 in a sense, you're not, you, know, you could say you're depriving her of, ch of chasing a cat or something, but really what you're doing is enhancing her life, and, you, and I try to tell people a number of things, that you can enhance a dog's life by stopping them from doing something and doing something that you want, and you can unleash a leashed dog. I've had people ask me that by giving them the freedom to smell or, you know, cock their head and try to locate sounds or, or damn it, just eat something that you find is disgusting and they think is gourmet. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's one thing that uh, I loved in the book is talking about learning your dog. Uh, and again, I'll use JJ before I get to our, our final question. But um, I, when I brought her home, I try taking her on big hikes. Uh, I worked for the media, so I had access to some conservation areas. So she and I, you know, I'd get a nice long leash and we'd go for these long two hour hikes. I tried taking her camping with me. I did all of these things. And I started to notice when we'd go on a hike or we'd go on a walk after about 20, 25 minutes, she'd start pulling in the other direction. Uh huh. And it, I, I would, it was funny to me because we'd be in these lush green spaces where she's smelling things and seeing things and enjoying them. And the second she saw the car, she was digging in and running back to that thing and jumping inside and laying down in the air conditioning. And then we'd go home to the apartment and I'd say, well, do you want to, like, we can go for another walk and try and get her to go? Said, nope. We're going inside. And she lays down on the cool floor and like holds on to a toy. And I have learned she doesn't like going for more than half an hour, whether yeah. it's a walk around the block or a big hike. She right. says, like, no, nope, I'm done <laughs> and right. starts walking home. But that's that's one of those little ones of, OK, so how do we then make this best? And exactly what you said, uh, I live in the middle of a dense urban center, so I can't have her off leash very often. But <laughs> at least twice a day, we go on what I call her walks, which is yep. we walk. And if she starts going in one direction, that's the direction we're going in. Yep. Right. It's easy enough to loop back home, but that just it's just a little thing uh, of letting her. And sometimes she'll stop at a corner and look at me because she doesn't know which way to go. So then I walk one way and she follows and, you know, but it's it's very much a it's a it really is a two way relationship. Right. And that's where the trade off is. You know, you're you know, you might want to get more exercise or walk more, but the walk is really for her. So she has to exercise her nose or her ears or her eyes. And then, you know, it, it's like the, the analogy I make is imagine going to a museum or, you know, a music concert, and all of a sudden somebody covers your eyes or yanks you away from a painting or a picture or covers your ears so you can't hear the music. You know, they're, they're, that's what you're doing when your dog is sniffing or trying to, you know, 
redirect sensory information into their nose, their ears, their mouth, their eyes, and you pull them along. And, you know, we call it female in that sense. And it's almost like, you know, dogs are tweeting to one another. And and they are. I mean, there's information there. You know, Lord, I don't want to put my nose where my dogs have put their noses. But, but, but I always tell the story about a woman at a dog park who once asked me if I thought that pulling a dog along and not allowing them to sniff could cause them some psychological anxiety. And there's no reason to think it doesn't because they want to get a, as complete a picture as possible, say, of an odor or of a sound or something visual. And so let them. The walk is for them. And yeah. if, you want, if you want more exercise and your dog doesn't, then go off on, go off on your own. But dogs will learn very, very fast. They will learn that a, a walk may go in a certain direction, although you give them a choice. I used to do that, too. Or it's going to last a certain amount of time. It's not like they have their iPhone out and are clocking the walk. And you will reach a happy medium at some point where they're going to learn, well, if I sniff all this time, then I might not, I might not even get around the block. Mm-hmm. Well, it's my, my upstairs, my old neighbors uh, have a uh, basset hound and their walks are maybe a block. Yeah. Uh, because the dog just wants to sniff the whole time, but he gets what he needs out of it. That's right. And, and, then, and then, you know, I always tell people if they can find a place where the dog can be off leash, they'll get, they'll, they'll get their exercise. But yeah, I mean, sometimes, I mean, sometimes when I walk or ride my bike, I want to do it more as a training thing. And sometimes I want to do it just to take in the sights and I don't want people rushing me along. Yeah. And, and so once again, when you get back to the importance of exercising the senses, what it does, and you know, as an ethologist, what it does is it makes me think about how, how their brains work when they are sniffing, smelling, or hearing something, for example. Um, and I mean, Jumping into their paws, if you will, or jumping into their sense organs and imagining the information that they're acquiring, which, uh, you know, to which we don't have access. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why am I supposed to think that a dog sniffing isn't getting anything? I guarantee you the dog sniffing is getting as much out of sniffing as I might as staring at a painting. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Uh, and it also ties into what I wanted to ask you. And this is it's it's a great last question, because I feel that if I recall correctly, it's a conversation we had several years ago, the first time you and I spoke when I still worked for a newspaper and we were talking about coyotes. Um, do dogs feel guilt? And there's a little bit in the book on this. And it's a great subject because some people say yes, some people say no. But the question I want to ask is, why does it matter if it's actually guilt as we know it? Well, that's a great question. So the deal with guilt is a very simple one. <clears throat> I think that when the proper studies are done, we will discover that dogs feel guilt. Recently, over the last couple of years, there was a question of whether dogs feel jealousy. And of course, every time I'd pose that to somebody, they'd go, what, are you crazy? You know, they'd say something like, you researchers, you academics, you, you scientists, just beat the hell out of something. Of course, dogs feel jealousy. Well, a study was done that showed very clearly that using the same methods that are used on pre-verbal children, you watch their behavior from which people draw the conclusion that the kids are feeling jealous. So the same paradigm was used. And once again, you can't really differentiate the data set for the dogs from the human, uh, from the dogs, from the kids. And so people will agree dogs feel jealousy. The, the problem is, is nobody's ever really studied it that way. The big misunderstanding about um, guilt is that um, – a very excellent dog researcher, Dr. Alexandra Horowitz, studied how good people were at detecting guilt in dogs. And it turned out that it was a very small sample, but the data are important in the sense that we're not very good at detecting guilt, that there might be a dog who shows a guilty expression or we interpret it as guilty. 
when they haven't done anything. She specifically has said over and over again, and I've been one of the champions of this, saying she didn't ask and she wasn't studying whether or not dogs feel guilt. So do dogs feel guilt? Yes, I think they do. Do I, Why? I think from an evolutionary point of view, it's very hard to imagine that do, any, any animal that forms deep social relationships and is a social being doesn't have the capacity for guilt. So when you really want to get hardcore about it, all you can say is, or all I will say is, we don't really know, but there's no reason to think that when the proper studies are done, that we won't learn that dogs feel guilt. But stop citing one particular paper that showed that we're not very good at reading guilt, but it didn't show that dogs don't feel guilty. That's a f- lovely, twisty. <laughs> st- it's just the way it's the way it's phrased. I love that uh, that whole thing. And JJ, people always think she's guilty or sad because she has uh, she's black and tan, so she's got those German Shepherd eyebrows. Well, yeah. Yep. So whenever she looks up. She looks sad, sad and guilty. It's adorable, but um, she rarely feels sad and guilty as far as I can tell. Um, yeah. If we're going to say one thing, we want everyone considering having a dog, everyone who has a dog, um, or frankly, you know, any other pet. Uh, what's the one take home out of all of this uh, that you would like people to know about dogs or pets? Oh, yeah, yeah. That always puts me on the spot. Mm-hmm. That's I why I do it. Yep. I guess the one thing I, (laughs) thank you. I guess the one thing I would want would be for people to honor each and every dog as an individual and recognize their individual personalities and, you know, their uniqueness, if you will. Um, So that would be the one thing. And, but built into that would be fully understanding the, your responsibility as a human guardian, if you will, caretaker, caregiver, to give that dog as many freedoms as possible because they are continually having to adapt to a human world. And if you're not ready to do that, then you might not be ready to bring a dog into your life. To get a copy of Unleashing Your Dog, visit your local library or preferred bookstore. More about Mark can be found on markbeckoff.com as well as through his regular column on psychologytoday.com. That's Mark with a C. I want to thank Mark for his time and all of you for checking out this episode. Remember to subscribe on your preferred podcast player. And if you have a moment, rate and review the show on that podcast app or just come visit on Facebook at Defender Radio Podcast and rate there. Every rating and review makes it easier for new listeners to find the show and help us find a more compassionate world. A special thanks this week to Brendan Jackson, who took the beautiful photo of JJ, who graces this week's episode art. I am quite certain all of us will be seeing a lot more photos from Brendan in the coming weeks, months, and years. Until next time, I'm Michael Howie for Defender Radio, reminding you to be kind and stay informed and stay strong. (laughs) 